Bada bum bum. Bada bum bum. <clears throat> we got boom. There we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Hello, and welcome to my little video on um, exorcism. Thank you very much for joining me or watching uh, afterwards. My name is John. Um, I create a website called Practically, which helps people learn closure uh, from my own experiences and from the community. And today I'm going to do some closure exercises as part of the summer of S expressions or sexps. And uh, so there's already been some introduction videos into closure, so I'm going to dive right into the code. Because uh, I think the best way to understand closure is to actually start using it and experimenting with it. It's a very dynamic language, so it's very easy to do. Uh, so there are, how, uh, there's about 70 or 80, well, 86 exercises uh, in total on closure. I've done some of these, uh, not all of them. So the green ones I've done and the blue ones I've still to do. And we're going to cover four exercises if I've got time. Uh, starting with RNA transcripts and a similar one, which is nucleotide count. And both of these will cover kind of some of the iteration over maps and uh, defining a data structure and some interesting functions from the closure um, core library, which uh, there are about over 700 functions now to learn. You don't have to learn them all at once, but uh, they are, all very data centric as is closure so there's an awful lot there to get going with and so it makes creating your own specific code very quick and simple so let's have a look at rna transcription uh, so the crux of this uh, problem really is we want to convert from one thing to another the first thing is dna uh, and we want to convert to RNA strands. And it doesn't matter if you don't know what those are because we are actually given a nice little conversion table. So if we have a DNA, um, uh, DNA nucleotide, uh, which is G, then we can convert that into RNA, uh, the C uh, nucleotide. So we've got this nice little mapping that we do. So basically we want to be able to write a function that uh, can use this. It's almost like a state transition. Uh, and we map each character of a, a DNA sequence that we're given into the equivalent RNA sequence. So let's dive into the code. I've already downloaded these projects using the, um, using the exorcism uh, command line. And it's given me a project here. I've got a project open. I'm using NeoVim, uh, but there are many, many editors you can use for Clojure. And it's a fairly straightforward project structure. I've got source code under source. I've got my unit tests under tests. And you can see the test code uh, is kind of matching the, the naming uh, convention of the source code. So we've got RNA transcript an RNA transcript test. That way all the tests referring to the <clears throat> uh, source code is in its equivalent test uh, file. And there is a <clears throat> there's a configuration file here which just defines the any dependencies that we want. And there's a test runner we can use. I also have in my own test runner I can set up and uh, Closure is kind of built into the uh, closure CLI tool that we're going to use to drive everything. Uh, so let's just hide that. So we've got the mapping here and we've got a, a function. So this is kind of the starting point. We haven't actually got a solution yet. And in order to be able to run the tests, we need to have a, a, a function uh, to evaluate. Uh, so we've got this, def we're defining a function here called to RNA. And at the moment we're just returning, well, we're returning nothing. This is the argument. We're not taking any arguments yet. 
and we we're not returning anything either. By default, a function will return nil if there's no other value to return. Uh, so let's have a look at the tests. Uh, so we can see from the tests here that, that each test is calling this to RNA function. And the test code is, is pretty straightforward. It's, again, we've got this namespace that defines uh, this logical grouping of our tests relative, uh, respective to testing this RNA transcription namespace. And we're inclu including a library called closure test and specific functions from that uh, library. We're only going to use def test and is. Def test just defines a test and is 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 an assertion. An assertion is defined by is. Uh, so these are both functions from that library that we've just included in there. Uh, we can just use them straight away. Uh, and so we're defining a test with the name and each test has its own assertion. You can have multiple assertions in here as well if you want. And uh, we're basically saying, uh, we're defining this predicate and we're saying this is our expected value and we want to, and we're going to call a function from our uh, namespace under test uh, with an argument. So if we call this to RNA with C, we should get a G. So we need to make that work somehow. Uh, so this is the kind of main body of my code. Uh, and this, this does compile, uh, so I can evaluate this. Uh, what I do is start a REPL, uh, which is like the uh, runtime environment. So this runs all my closure code. Uh, so I'm in the root of my project. And I'm going to run a closure REPL. Uh, you can use CLJ, which gives you a very uh, simple in UI. Um, but I'm going to use something that's a little bit more interesting to use. Uh, sure. Boom. Um, boom. And this is called Rebel. Uh, so it's a REPL with Rebel. <clears throat> and this gives a nicer user interface. Uh, you can, of course, all do this all in the Exorcism uh, uh, editor but it doesn't give you kind of that REPL feedback, um, which is very nice to have. <clears throat> so I can actually define, uh, I can actually define closure expressions in here. And it's, you see it's actually giving me uh, hints and, and documentation about the, the function calls and what to, uh, what arguments to give things. It's quite nice. Uh, so let's do something very simple just to make sure the REPL's working. Uh, so here I'm going to call uh, a map function. Oh, um, can't type anymore. There we go. And it's making sure that the it's showing me that the parentheses are matched. So here I'm calling a map function, uh, uh, which is going to take each value in this um, collection and apply this function to it. And this function just increments the value by one. So if I press Enter, it evaluates that expression, and I get my results. There we go. <clears throat> so rather than type everything into the REPL, we use our editor that's connected to our REPL. Um, uh, so just make sure that's running. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Uh, ooh, where did it go? Let's see, there we go. So that should be running the REPL now. Uh, yeah. Didn't want to do that. Uh, no. Boom, boom, boom. Huh. I'm confusing myself now. Uh, but there we go. Uh, there we go. So we're now connected to the REPL that I was running uh, from the editor. So I can now evaluate things in the editor. Send it to the REPL and we get a result. So I can evaluate this namespace, which just defines it just basically loads the, this uh, namespace and any require function. So we're requiring closure string. 
So I've added, basically added closure string library to this namespace. Um, and I can do the same thing with this function. <coughs> and so it's showing me that it's evaluated this function into the namespace. And so now I can actually call that. I won't actually do anything, but I can call it if I wanted to. So I can just call that with to uh, RNA. Doesn't take any arguments. Uh, so if I evaluate this, it's not going to do, do anything too exciting. It's just going to return nil. Uh, if I uh, put in a value one, it'll return one. Uh, I just need to reevaluate that again. There we go, and now it's one. So I can dynamically develop the code uh, very quickly just by changing it, evaluating it, and uh, seeing what it does. And so it's a very rapid way of developing, designing code. And to order, in order to keep a separation between the code I'm writing and code I'm going to eventually ship and the code I'm still experimenting with, using this comment expression. And so everything inside the comment is uh, is not going to be run if I evaluate the whole source code file. So if I run tests, or if I just run the program, these things are basically essentially commented out. It's like a, a line comment on steroids, but it allows me to basically go in and still evaluate the expressions. Uh, but do so while I'm while I'm just experimenting, and then copy them into the main part when I'm ready. So how do I define and represent the data? Closure being a very data-centric um, language, then it's uh, it's quite uh, a focus of it to think how do I represent the data? And there's quite a few different data structures built in. We're already been looking at lists. So a round bracket represents a list. So there's a list with elements in there. And the the list is special because it treats the first element as a function call and everything else as a um, as an argument to that function call. Um, you can use the quote to um, just treat it as data, uh, but most of the time we use lists to uh, call functions or define functions in class. Uh, so here we're defining not a function as such, but a name, a symbol that's going to have a value and we can give it a doc string and the uh, the value we're coming up with is we're just defining this hash map and so a hash map is uh yeah it's like a dictionary in python and other languages basically a mapping so we've got a key uh, which just happens to be a string and that key is associated with another uh, with the value which is another string and that's so we've got four key value pairs in our map and uh, our map has to be balanced. If we got rid of one of these things, then we'd have a missing uh, value for key A. Oh, that's good. Uh, so that's my linter telling me that I've got something missing. <clears throat> so we can very easily create this state transition by saying, uh, if we want to know what G should be transformed to, we can look at G and it's gonna return C from the hash map. Um, so that's what we're doing here. We've defined, we could have a very simple function that is uh, two RNA and it takes uh, a nucleotide. So just one uh, character. And we get from the DNA dictionary, which is our name that we defined, uh, the nucleotide. So if we evaluated both of these, Then I can call uh, to RNA uh, with a, let's call it G, because I know that's going to be C. And if we evaluate this, we get a result. So it's a very simple way to create a dictionary and yeah, basically have a look at table state transition as you wish. Uh, Um, if we were going to do this, uh, uh, normally I'd kind of create a, I create a function with two arguments and I'd actually pass in the dictionary 
uh, into the function as well. This makes it a more pure function, as it's called, because it's taking all the arguments. It's not pulling in any arguments from outside, whereas the DNA dictionary is it, it's kind of using this namespace global um, uh, name, global symbol, and pulling that in uh, to, so there's kind of a bit of a side effect there. It's not a big issue in this little challenge, but uh, normally you would kind of take this approach where you would give a function all of its arguments, and then the function itself is always deterministic. If you give the same input to the function, it's always going to give you the same output. Um, and this works as well. So if we can uh, define that, uh, yeah, so we get G. Um, so that's okay for a single sequence, but what about if we want uh, multiple? So if we've got this string, um, there's a really handy function called map. Uh, so if you space L and H for the distinctions. So this basically is going to return a sequence uh, by applying the function to um, all the items in that uh, map. So we're going to take, so map is going to take this function uh, and this is just an example. This is not part of the solving the channel challenge. Um, uh, so we're going to map this function over these characters. And this function is basically just an anonymous function. It doesn't have a, an external name. So we're using this function in line. This is called a lambda function. And basically this is converting each character into lowercase. So lowercase takes a single character and so this is what we're passing in. Passing in this function takes an argument of character and we pass that character to the lowercase function. And hopefully that does the conversion. So that converts all of the uh, characters into the lowercase equivalent. Let me do that as a comment. Uh, there we go. So uh, to give it as a reference and so we can do the same thing with our uh, with our nucleotides. So we've got our DNA, we've got a dictionary, and we can map that over uh, by passing each nucleotide, each character, the same thing. So at this time, it's going to convert it uh, to RNA. And we can see we get nil, nil, nil uh, all the time. So, oh, there's a bit of a problem. Uh, but luckily we've got a REPL so we can investigate what that problem is. And so we do need to uh, refactor. If we actually look at what the output was of this. Um, so we started with a string of uh, characters. Uh, and we ended up with a sequence of individual strings. And so um, it's, it's converting when we're doing the... Uh, when we're using the map, it's treating each of these uh, elements in the string as its own value. So it's pulling out A, uh, and it, when you pull out A from uh, the string, it's going to be a character rather than a string. So when we're actually uh, doing the get function from the dictionary, um, we're actually passing this nucleotide we're passing is a character so we actually need to convert that to a string and there's a built-in function called str which converts pretty much anything into uh, a string within reason anything legal enclosure into a string um, and so now when we do this uh, then that will uh, that should work um, i think we can use this again now we, yeah so now we've got our characters instead of strings uh, you notice I'm, I'm kind of closure is by nature it's it's re read in order but when you're in the REPL you can kind of as long as things are evaluated you can call them and whatever was evaluated last um, the most recently so here's my DNA RNA definition I just updated that definition and now it's using that definition when I call uh, DNA to RNA in this expression um, so now we get uh, our uh, so we're getting our converted characters, but again, it's still a sequence and it's not a single string. Uh, if we looked at our test, 
then we can see it's actually looking for a string and not a sequence of character sequence of strings so we need to do something about that as well uh, and so another refactor um, oh I did that one um, boom, boom, boom. so uh, I can use join to to join things up so I can do um, if we take this Oop. Take this boom, 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 and we do uh, boom. closure dot string join. Uh, that's our expression, and oop. so that we've just copied the the result from that. Now it's it's complaining that string is not a, uh, a function call, so this is. If I leave it as a list, it's going to complain that this is not a function call and an error. But I can use the quote uh, symbol, which is just a uh, shorthand for uh, quote. Boop, boop, boom, boom. Oh. Uh, and so if I quote that, we go. There you go. So that will just treat the, that sequence of characters as a uh, as data it won't try and evaluate the the u there which is which is nice so if we do that uh but normally you would just use the, the actual quote character um because it's uh simpler and uh, looks nice if we evaluate that now we can see we get the uh, single string with all the characters in so if you put all that together uh, in this new 2NRA function definition, put a nice uh, description in there. So we take a DNA strand, um, we're going to join the result of mapping DNA over RNA, um, uh, a DNA dictionary. Um, we're using this short form of a function here. So um, Uh, yeah, so in, previously we've used, where is it, there is it, yeah, we used this, boom, uh, boom. we've used this form of expression to define a function, so a function takes one argument, and we can replace that with uh, a simpler form of the same function, so this is still an anonymous function, uh, but we just use this hash uh, sequence. Let's put them in the right place. Oh, no. So these are kind of equivalent. Oh, I missed off a. There it is. Whoops. I've broken it now. Uh, yeah, I'll just leave that there. So this is a. There we go. Uh, so this form is the kind of full form for a function, uh, an, an anonymous function that we use in line. And we can use this simpler version, uh, DNA to RNA. Um, so basically remove, we're dropping the, the, the function and the argument, and we're using these placeholders for the argument. So percent is basically the argument. And it just keeps it, the code a little bit simpler. And uh, it's something to get used to, but it's quite nice to use. Uh, so we're basically taking this function here and applying it to each element in our DNA sequence and we should get the results. Uh, boom. So if we use a test example, uh, oop, did I do something wrong? There we go. Something's not quite right. Uh, oh. Did I mush these up? I don't know. Uh, let's go back to that. Okay, so yeah, so if I map this over here, you can see we're getting some issues still because uh, X 
and F are not part of the uh, uh, are not part of the dictionary, so we actually get nulls in this place. So we need to do some error handling. And um, we can basically just throw a, a function. So in the end, that's just basically dipping down into this throw, or some throw assertion thing here. So we can throw a, we can use the underlying Java code to throw an asser assertion. So this assertion error is from the underlying um, host for uh, our closure uh, runtime, which is using Java uh, underneath, is j using the Java JVM underneath. Um, and so uh, we can use some of those uh, function calls. So this is basically creating a search and error class from Java uh, using this dot notation. You could also use uh, like a, it's basically creating a new assertion error object um, I'm passing that an argument and then using the closure throw to, to throw that out. Uh, because if we, uh, if we include this in our code, uh, we need to make sure this is not actually being called. Uh, so there's a nice kind of little technique where we use this uh, or function. Uh, and so we basically do an or of um, the, we check to see, well, we convert our uh, on our uh, DNA in here. Uh, and if that works, then we're done. It, it, the all will just stop there. If that's, if that returns a true value, then we don't need to do anything else. Um, however, if we, uh, if we do have an error, then we can, uh, uh, oops, what did I do? Oh, uh, if we do have an error, uh, then we can put this throw into here. So if convert DNA f uh, returns any uh, false values, which could be nil or um, or false, the Boolean false, then it'll throw this new session over, and uh, that will cover the bases for um, the characters that are not in our dictionary. So our final solution is uh, here. So I'm going to copy that and put that up into the top of my code. Replace that one. Boom. Uh, oops, no, what? Ooh. Why is playing games to me today? So we've got our map. Um, oh, that's strings. Um, oh yes, um, yeah. So rather than convert the uh, the nucleotide into um, a string each time when the map is extracting from it, so this, when this map function is going over each of the each of the nucleotides. It's going to convert it into a, um, a character. So we may as well just use characters in our uh, mapping. So it's going to return a character. So we're going to look up a character and it's going to return a character. Uh, and that way we only have to use one uh, string function to join the finishing function at the end. Um, Did I put my data in the wrong place? Yeah, I did. There we go. No. There. No. Why is it complaining? Oh. Um, mm -hmm. I think I've missed something off. Let me just check. 
uh, live coding. You always have to have some something that doesn't work when you're live coding. Uh, source code. Boop. Oh, um, did I DNA to RNA? Oh, is it still thinking it's a function? No, that's not right. I shouldn't be doing that. Uh, let's see if it works. Let's try that. So we go to the we little test runner. It's going to run all the tests, tell me whether the code is working or not. We can also submit this to uh, Exorcism and it should work. Why is that taking so long? There we go. So all the tests pass. There we go. Um, oops. And uh, I have all the tests kind of working in here. So they're all passed on here. Uh, so this is basically, yeah, this is the same as what I've submitted to uh, Exorcism. There we go. Cool. So that's one down. Let's look at another one. So this is nucleotide count. What do we do for here? Uh, we've got another string and we want to find out whether, um, well, how many of each nucleotide is in the DNA sequence, essentially. And if there is a an incorrect, uh, nucleotide in the sequence, then we throw an error. All right. Uh, so we're doing nucleotide counts. And you can do all the testing and running the REPL from, uh, from an editor. You don't need to have separate terminals open all the time like I've got here. Um, I'm just used to using the command line myself. Uh, oops. Out. So let's run the REPL in here. Again, I'm just in the root of the nucleotide uh, count project, which I've downloaded. Um, we do closure uh, M. So closure is the command line tool that runs uh, closure project, closure code, and we can give it uh, what we call aliases to run different tools as well. So here I'm running uh, the REPL tool. And I'm going to uh, quit from that. And boom, boom, boom. That count. Right, so again, this is just the project. Again, it's just the same. Uh, some of the exorcism projects, because uh, these are older versions, they've got the project CLA, CLJ filing, which is the lining and configuration for these. Uh, whereas the depths Eden is the closure CLI configuration. Uh, essentially, they're just defining the uh, the dependencies that the library uses and any other tools that you're going to use with this project. Uh, the code itself is is the same whether you use Lining and or uh, Closure CLI. Uh, so let's fire up Astro, which is uh, my configuration for NeoVim. I go up in the source nucleotide source uh, no test. Nucleotide count, there we go. So let's look at the test. And we can see, so it's the same setup, closure test library. Uh, we can see that we've got uh, two different functions here. So we've got this count of nucleotides in a strand, which is taking a single character uh, and a string that we're looking for. And then there's this nucleotide counts, which is just giving, take, which is just given a string but it's expecting uh, a, a, a data structure back, it's expecting a hash map of um, keys and value pairs, and the keys being characters in this case, whereas uh, our nucleotide strand is expecting a, an integer value. So there's two different things here. Uh, this one's the simpler return value. We're just returning a simple integer. So we'll have a look at this one first. Uh, let's go to the top of this. So we've got our two functions we've defined. Uh, so we're going to try and solve this uh, count of nucleotides in strand first. Again, I've got my rich comment form. 
what I'm going to do some experiments with. Uh, I did start the ripple, didn't I? Yes, I did. Okay. Long hair. Okay, there we are. So that's my REPL running. Let's just to check to make sure it's there. I don't really, again, you could, uh, I don't really use the buffer very much, but it's nice to kind of see some, uh, some of the longer output in there as well. <clears throat> so we've got these two functions, and uh, again, how do we define the data? Um, what it kind of gave us. Um, there's no mapping this time. So again, it's just, so this time it's just simple data structure. We wanna know what the valid nucleotides are because at some point we need to check whether something is valid or not. And if it's not valid, then we can throw an error. So we define this with, this is our starting point. And nice thing about closure is you can kind of come up with a data structure, test it out, evaluate it in the REPL, see if it works. And if you need to change it, then you just change it and reevaluate it and uh, and see see what happens. So it's very easy to experiment. Um, so now we can test to see whether something's in there. Um, so we're using this sum function. So sum takes a predicate. So we can use this anonymous function like we've used before. So basically, this is a function, and the function body says. Uh, is equal g the value we get from uh, our valid nucleotides. So basically it's going to check if g is even within our nucleotide data structure. Uh, and if we do that, you can see it's true. Uh, we can also wrap g in a set and we could use set as a predicate as well. A little bit more fancy, but it's kind of a nice shortcut as well. Uh, um, so um, I've missed off something. I'm like, okay, right, yeah. So we can count. Um, yeah, I've missed something off here. I? Yes. So I was going to uh, count the. Oh yeah, I need to count the functions first, don't I? I missed the bit off. There we go. Did I did I do it later on? Uh, I think I must have deleted that bit. Oops. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so let's do this. So um, if we've got a string, we can count uh, how many things are in the string. I think there we go. There's nothing in there. If we put. Um, an A in there, then we can count those. Um, and so we can use the we use the get uh, from a string. Uh, well, we use our valid ne uh, nucleotides, can't we? Uh, so get from, uh, and then is there a an A? Let's do an A. Uh, uh, did I do it right? What am I doing wrong? Brain's gone. Sorry. Uh, what am I doing? What was I doing? Uh, oh. yeah, yeah, there we go. Um, oh yeah. Sorry. That's what I was going to do. Um, so I don't. I want to get. I want to. Um, if I need to know the the total, uh, I need to know how often it's um, how often it's occurring. What's its frequency? Um, is there something called frequencies in closure? Frequency? Oh, there is. Nice. There we go. So returns a map of distinct items. Um, 
that's for I think that's for the second part. Yeah. So uh, what did I do for the first part? I've gone blank for a second. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Uh, uh, nucleotide count. Let's look at the right one. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, it was that one. I was thinking of something else. Oh, yeah. For, uh, yes, dot frequencies. I'm thinking of something else for now. Boom. So we got a valid nucleotide, and um, so we want to know how many characters are in there of a specific type. So if we're given a string, let's have a look at an example that we're given. Let's take this example from the code, from the test code. Uh, it's always useful to start with the tests and then you know the tests will pass. Uh, so if we've got this string, I want to see how often A appears. So let's just come back to that bit. So let's uh, let's count the uh, occurrences. Uh, so we've got a string. Where's our string go? Yep. Uh, oh. And so we just say so we wanted to know how often. Uh, a was in there, all we could do is just get rid of everything else and say we only want A. So we can filter uh, on the string, um, but we need a some kind of predicate to do that. So let's create a little anonymous function. Well, let's just do a function. Um, so we want to uh, take each nucleotide and then we want to uh, basically say is that equal to um, so is equal the the value we get from the uh, string nucleotide and let's say we want a from there So now we see we get uh, a, we get two occurrences. So we could just do something simple like uh, count. Let's just move that so the it's in the right place. The parens are bar balanced. And if we evaluate that now, see we get two. So we're converting the original data structure. We're filtering out the ones, the the characters that we don't want, and then we're counting how many is left. Um, and that's nice and simple. Uh, and if we've got the uh, valid nucleotides, then we can use this throw exception to see if if it's not in there, then we can throw that out. Uh, we can throw out the we can throw out an exception if we get that. So we need to need like a, an if um, if statement um, which uses let's see let's do some let's do this one so that's our condition for our if and then if it's true we do uh, if it's true or if it's false so when it's false we want to do this throw throwable again it's just tapping into uh, the uh, oh, there's a bracket missing there. Oop. There you go. So if it's false, we want to. So if it's false, basically it's saying that G is not in the nucleotides, which actually is. So I should use something else for that. Hang on a so if it's G, then.
then we're going to use the the um, the true path. Uh, and if we were using something like X, then it would use the the false path throwable. Um, so if we do that, uh, then we get throwable in here. I think. Yeah. So now we're getting a, a throwable error. So that's working. Cool. So that's an error we actually wanted. <laughs> Whereas if we do G, uh, that is in there, so we should get true. We get true. Uh, so now in the path, we can use our count filter. Um, we can put that into the true path here. Oop, there we go. We get two. So there's two G's uh, in our, is that right? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, we're hard coding that into there, isn't there? That's, uh, yeah, we, we need to write a function around that. Uh, and our function was called, uh, not that, oh, our function was called, this. So if we define a function called that and give it an argument. Um, let's call it new nucleotide. Uh, and then if nucleotide is that, so we want to change that. But Um, we want to do that same thing again here. Boom. There we go. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so we've got a naming clash here. <laughs> so what I can do is actually just get rid of uh, the larger form. And we'll just use the short form of the anonymous function. We just use the uh, the first argument that's passed. Um, and then, oh, yeah, we need, oh, actually, we need the strand, don't we, strand, to satisfy that. So this becomes, that now becomes the strand. Oops, strand. There we go. Now that's our function defined. So in theory, um, so if we go to the test, grab the, grab one of these test values. Um, and if we call, uh, we call count uh, nucleotide strand, we give it a, Strand and then the character. What character was it using? T. No oh, T. There's T. There is a T there. Uh, so let's do that. T. 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 So if we call this. Um, oh, oops. Defn. It's a function, not not a value. Uh, there we go. There we go. We got one. Woohoo! So we can actually put this function into our uh, solution. Uh, so we replace that one. Boom. And we could go and run our tests if we wanted to. Um, run nucleotide count. Yes. Uh, so it's closure. No tests. So this will pass some tests, it'll fail other tests. So I think it's either three or four tests it passed or failed. I can't remember which it will tell us. It failed them all, it's done something wrong. Oh, uh, I forgot to copy over the valid nucleotides, didn't I? Yes, that was silly. So it's trying to use um, these valid nucleotides, uh, but I haven't actually defined it in the main thing yet. 
this and I can run the uh, tests in the REPL but it's also good to also run tests externally because it's using files it's using the files as they are righted to, to disk uh, rather than the evaluations you put into the REPL um, so hopefully this should run and run a few uh, tests. You can also use this in watch mode. So as soon as you make a change, then it will rerun the tests. So it's failed um, some tests and it's passed other tests. Uh, yes, so we haven't actually done this counting nucleotides, so I would expect those to be failing. And it's showing me um, that rather than expected value we're getting, we're actually getting nil. Um, so we know we've still got a little way to go. Oops, wrong one. Um, okay, so that's part one. So let's have a look at the second function. Second, yeah, second function we need to solve. Um, so we could map um, over the valid new uh, over the. Oh, that's where I was looking at. Okay, there we go. There we go. No, I've done that one. Okay. Um, so we need to return this form. Um, so how do we do that? Um, we could use a map, a map over the, the string that we get. But there is a nice function in Clojure called frequencies. Um, and if you like, sit back and think about uh, a problem for a little time, we usually refer, this, refer to this as hammock time. It takes some time to think about what you're actually trying to achieve. Uh, talk about it in kind of English language, and then often there's a as a meaningful function that has a similar kind of t uh, name than what you're trying to do. So here, if I was thinking, how often does something appear? What's its frequency? Then okay, that kind of gives you a hint that maybe the frequencies function in Closure Core, uh, in Closure Standard Library, would actually help you uh, solve the problem. Uh, so if we evaluate that with a test. Uh, string from our test classes we actually see the form is is there it's so uh, like is that is that enough have we finished have we got uh, success um, well the problem is what if something isn't there so if we actually deleted um, the T from there we haven't got a value for T we're always supposed to have a value for each of the counts even if it's zero so Frequencies does most of the work, but we need to do something else. Um, and when you're counting, you're, you're kind of counting from, well, you count from, you start with nothing, you start with zero, and then you start counting. So what if we actually had a starting condition so saying everything is zero until we find out more information? So we could actually just define our start condition uh, using a map. So here, yeah. So here we've got uh, our map of characters uh, and their values. So they're all starting at zero. And then if we merge that, uh, so we can use a, a merge function, which is basically combines two maps together. And there's some examples there it gives us. Um, yeah. So um, we can take the starting position. and then we get the result of frequencies so even if we use the one that's uh, there without the t uh, we've got t as a starting point so if we merge this on top it will update the existing characters that match uh, with their frequencies uh, and we still get a value for t because that's what we started with Ta -da! there we go uh, so now we can just include that into the function uh, and uh, we should be done, I think. So where's our nucleotide counts? So uh, let's, uh, oops, uh, no. Be be be. Let's see, boom. 
Okay, let's run our tests and see if that actually did work. I think it does. I think that's what I submitted. Let's have a look, see what I submitted. I think I might have done this slightly differently in the... Uh, let's have a look. What iteration did I do? Oops, no. Oh, I did lots of different ones in here. Um, oh yeah, I used a four uh, as well. That's another option. I think the merge is quite simple because four, again, doesn't quite get you there. So frequencies yeah, simplifies this code as well. But sometimes you kind of have to write uh, a, a longer expression, then you come back and refactor it in the end. Uh, so this kind of shows you my journal of how I got uh, there. Um, yeah, and that was my end goal there as well. So hopefully that's... Uh, did I write the file? I always remember to write the file. Oh, I didn't write the file. <laughs> Oops, that would help. There you go. Uh, again, it's a, it's a nice sanity check to run the test separately. So normally before I do a commit, or before I, at least I push a commit, I'll run the tests and, um, and then we should all pass there as well. Um, we've got a little bit more time to do. So um, I was going to look at space age and bank account. I might just look at space age on here, actually. Um, I had to get some mentoring support on here. Uh, boom, boom. Let's see. So this was fairly uh, verbose when I first did that, but I iterated it around a little bit. So basically, we're trying to add, um, we're trying to find the orbital periods of uh, planets in our solar system, but we're given data based on the um, uh, the age of the Earth. Um, so let's see. I think that's that. Um, uh, let's show you this in here. Oop. Uh, we want to go to space age. And uh, no, oh, yeah, space age. There we go. Boom. There we go. Uh, so from the from the test, it's trying to do. Um, uh, from this test, we 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 have these uh, individual functions on Earth, on Mercury. So we basically have a function for each planet. Uh, so we need all these. Um, Oh, there's not supposed to be uh, on, on Earth function. Oh, I know, I've already got that. I just missed it. There we go. On Earth, there we go. Um, and so, yeah, what I was doing was, uh, yeah, I was thinking about how to represent the data, and then um, I'm going to calculate. The, the total, basically the time, the time in seconds that, um, uh, that something is taking to go around uh, the sun. So we work out the, the same thing for the Earth. Um, and so we basically take the orbital period of the Earth, which is 365 days and a half, and a quarter, sorry. Um, and then given the seconds, uh, we can just divide the seconds uh, by this value, and we get our uh, we get our results. So let's see. Oh, I'm not evaluating that, am I? But one, one, bye bye. This age. Bing, 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 bing. Boop. That's going slow. Boop. All the broadcasting slowing it down a little bit. Um, beep, beep, beep. 
There you go. Uh, so we've got an object period, and if I and calculate the, the hours, minutes, and years, uh, seconds in a year. Um, so, but that's relative to the Earth orbit period. Um, we can kind of generalize that into a function, and uh, and then yeah, just call seconds to years uh, with the seconds. Um, but we need to do that with the other planets. Um, so what I thought was kind of creating an orbital period section. Uh, and then we have uh, a function on Mercury, which does, which basically adds in this relative Mercury orbital period into the calculation. So everything else is the same. So you end up with on Mercury with a string and you get the specific orbital period for Mercury. Um, and then uh, uh, we can pass in, uh, so rather than repeat all this thing, what I was gonna do, what I've done is create a, this, uh, this higher order function. So we have function, Rather than turning a value, a specific value, like an integer, this function actually returns another function, uh, and then that function will be used to process uh, seconds. So this function here takes relative orbit uh, and basically adds into um, uh, into the calculation. So this is this is like adding Mercury orbital period into that calculation, and uh, your then able to just uh, have a more generic function that we can pass in each orbit into it, but the the common part is done in this function uh, and it's all the same. And so we can do, um, and we have this uh, extra function just to kind of take out some of the common, common things. Um, I've we've got seconds to earth years uh, uh, given a second, so I've actually just pulled that out uh, and done some pre-calculation here uh, of what the uh, what the seconds are um, uh, in terms of Earth years. So again, that's just factoring out a couple of bits that would otherwise be repeated over and over again. Uh, and so I came up with this uh, solution here, which I think is on the website. Uh, yeah. So now we've got, uh, now instead of defining lots of common things, uh, the only thing we've got is this call to relative age. Um, so we're passing in, uh, so we're passing in the orbital uh, periods for each planet relative to uh, the Earth's orbital thing. So that's our original data set that we've got. Um, and then this um, each of these uh, will take relative age uh, and inject it into uh, as the relative ob orbit into this calculation and return the right result. I can see we've got all the uh, answers done. Um, I did get a mentor suggestion of using a macro, but I think in, we both agreed that that was like way over the top. And macro is a really powerful way to extend the language. Um, but they're slightly different, they have slightly different um, uh, syntax and they're really most powerful for extending the language, for solving a, this specific thing, using a function or a, a higher order function is, is much more appropriate, I think, uh, in general. Uh, macro is very powerful, but then with great power comes great responsibility, as somebody said once. Um, and it also like potentially adds a more, lot more maintenance to your code if you're adding macros all over the place and people need to learn them when they're onboarding as well. So they can be very useful, but they have to be uh, treated with great respect as well. And I've got about 10 minutes left. I'm just going to squeeze in bank account. Uh, this is quite nice. Um, this is a fairly simple, in terms of the, like the algorithm, it's quite simple. Once you know one key aspect of closure, 
And if you don't know that, then it's quite hard. Um, so I have an iteration here. So basically we want a bank account. Uh, let's go look, look at the, uh, look at the instructions. So we want a, an account, uh, it can be accessed in multiple ways. We can make deposits, withdrawals. Um, and the, the interesting thing, uh, is that we can access the bank with multiple threads processes. Um, so we need to manage some concurrency. Uh, and if you watch the introduction video to um, some of uh, S expressions, then you would know that Clojure is very good at managing concurrency because it's got something called software transactional management or something like that. Is that right? Software transactional memory. Oh, he's a uh, Clojure STM. It's something so ingrained, I can't remember what it's called now. Yeah, so if you go and look for closure uh, refs and transactions, yeah, you've got this uh, software transactional memory. There you go. Uh, so there's a lot more details about that. But essentially, we can have something like uh, something called an atom that will uh, act as a, a mutable container. So everything in closure is immutable. So like once you define it, it doesn't change like a string in most languages once you define a string then you actually create a new string to be able to change that string uh, in closure everything is like that except for the software transactional memory aspects so we can define uh, something called an an atom so our data structure here our states as it were uh, we're going to define as a bank account uh, bank accounts and that's going to be represented by a hash map which itself is immutable so once we've created the hash map we can't change it we have to uh, create an, a copy uh, and alter so we basically take the existing values in the hash map we change them or add to them or delete them uh, and return a new hash map and uh, so we're not affecting the existing anything that's using the existing value values in the hash map is not affected. We're creating a copy of that. So that way, actually reasoning about all your closure code is very, very simple because you're pretty much all of your code is deterministic and your values are immutable. So you know exactly what's happening. You don't have other parts of the system changing and and, and, and uh, changing values underneath you without knowing things so should there be kind of issues and errors then it's very easy to narrow down what's actually going on as well but most of the time it, it kind of prevents you even making those uh, issues as well so we use this atom function um, to wrap is essentially we're wrapping the empty empty hash map we've got here uh, into this container this container which we can change so it's it mutates we can we can change the value within it but the, the value within it is still Im, uh, immutable it still can't change we're just swapping values in and out which is why we need to use uh, specific uh, functions like swap there's also reset and we uh, give them by convention a nay a, like a, a question um, an exclamation mark at the end of the name this is like a naming convention that we use that's quite common for functions so where where we kind of we are doing mutable actions we'll put a, a bang an ex, uh, 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 an exclamation mark uh, after uh, as the last part of the name so uh, we're going to open an account and uh, so with this function and so we're creating an, a unique account ID, so we'd be able to access that. Um, so if we have a look at the uh, tests, can we look at the tests here? Boom. Uh, I've got to have to look at the tests now. Um, oh, there we are, tests. Oh, oh, all passed. Uh, Yeah, you can see, so uh, we're running bank account, open bank account, and then get balance. Um, 
we're returning uh, a zero. So we only need to return um, like the value. Uh, but I'm using a I'm using a, a like an account ID uh, just to make sure that the each account is unique. If we're going to open multiple accounts, we can return the account ID, uh, and we're associating uh, the uh, so we take the bank accounts map that's within the atom. That's why we have to use a swap. Um, so we basically say we want to swap in into the uh, atom uh, and we're using a function uh, to associate uh, the key uh, and the uh, the value so basically going to create an account ID um, with a zero value so basically creating a, a new account with a, a random UID and zero as the value and uh, and we're returning the account ID just so we know what that that actually is. Uh, so that means when we want to close the account, we could just pass the ID, and again we could go talk to the atom and say we want to disassociate uh, the account ID, and then that just removes the key value pair, and then we're done. Uh, and then for uh, get balance again, we're using the account ID. Um, we're not using swap this time. We just want to uh, look at the the value inside the atom. Um, we're not actually going to change it or affect it. Um, so we don't need a, spe a specific function to do that. We could just use the get. Um, but we do need to talk to the uh, the hash map that's inside the atom rather than the atom itself. So the atom itself is called bank accounts. And bank accounts atom contains a hash map uh, and if we dereference uh, this um, I think if we, oop, let me edit this Boop, come on. Uh, oh open it there we go. Um, so if we dereference this uh, this is using the um, this at sign which is the same as doing uh, Ref bank. Um, and so that basically what that does it pulls out the the hash map from uh, the bank accounts atom and from that hash map then we can just get the account ID and it returns the value and then up oh, update bank account is uh, We've got the account ID, we've got some credit we want to apply to it, and um, uh, and we're just doing an update function. So previously we did associate, disassociate, and now we're updating. Uh, so associate and disassociate just looks for the, uh, so associate just looks for the uh, key and swaps in a new value. Update will take the existing value uh, and we can run a function on that value to update it. So here we've got the anonymous function and we're just going to take the value that we've pulled out of the existing uh, account ID. Um, so that will be one if it was a new account. Uh, that'll be, sorry, that'll be zero if it was a new account. And we're adding the credit that we passed in as an argument to that. And then, so that function uh, updates the value and then that value is put back into the uh, into the atom and so then we can kind of do uh, uh, the multiple tests um, oh, there we go um, so there is we yeah so you have now um, you have bank accounts that are doing things uh, uh, one after the other so we need to make sure so the the atom makes sure that when all these different uh, calls to the uh, atom are made then only one call can be made at once and so it's kind of managing we don't need to lock the data before we change it uh, the atom is doing all that for us and so software transactional memory it's a bit like uh, when java started doing uh, 
uh, memory management for uh, C. It's it makes it a lot easier. You don't need to do any memory management here, and with Closure using an Atom, you don't need to do any uh, sort of locking and unlocking of uh, this value, this mutable uh, container that we're changing. Uh, that's all handled by Closure itself. Alrighty, I'm, uh, that's the end of the time I've got. Um, hopefully you found this very useful. i like to thank Bobby Towers and everybody who kind of worked on the Closure uh, tracks. It's very detailed, very good uh, things. And everybody at Exorcism for making such a wonderful uh, learning experience as well. If you want to find out more about um, some of the work I do for Closure, then you can go to practically.li and uh, there's lots of videos there that help you and some books to kind of help you uh, learn closure, but also the the development workflow as well, and some of the tooling that kind of helps do that as well. So practically, NeoVim kind of will show you how I've been doing some of the uh, editor work I've done today. Uh, this is quite new, but uh, I quite like it as well. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody, and I will see you uh, later. Thank you. Bye.